Dr. Peter Elsoff, thank you for coming to UNC today. It's a pleasure to talk to you. You are an expert on Russia and the former Soviet Union. You grew up in the Soviet Union. You came to the United States in 1994, I understand. And you work now and you teach at the, uh, at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. As you know, there's been quite a bit of tension recently between Putin, Russia, and the Western world. What do you think is happening in Russia? What are the developments? Why is that tension uh, there? And do you think we can talk about a new Cold War? Well, I don't compare it uh, with the Cold War. Clearly, there is a lot of tension. And um, the, main, the main reason, I think, because Putin is really uh, embracing a very new, uh, uh, an old new ideology of, of Eurasianism, which is basically uh, trying to rebuild uh, the Russian Empire combined with the traditions of the Soviet Union. Uh, at the same time, like I wouldn't call it a Cold War, a new Cold War, because it doesn't have the same global appeal. Uh, the Cold War clearly split the whole world in a half, and a half and half, in two parts. Uh, Russia does not have an ideology today which is, say, attractive to like Afghanistan or countries in Africa or in the Middle East. So, uh, with, with all the global consequences, there are clearly global consequences of uh, the recent political developments in Ukraine, particularly the fact that it's been the first time since World War II that a major nation in the Western world uh, bluntly annexed the territory, large territory of another nation. So this does have as a precedent very dangerous uh, consequences, say, for South Asia or for the Middle East, for other parts of the world. But I would not compare it uh, directly to the Cold War. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Putin clearly feels on the defensive, and recently his mm -hmm. foreign minister said that the West wants actually regime change in Moscow. Does he have a point? Uh, the West probably wishes, clearly, uh, Putin to go. Uh, but I don't think it's a plan uh, that this is a gross or over-exaggeration. Putin uh, thinks, uh, or, and at least the Russian media presents it uh, this way, that uh, all the so-called colored revolutions in the former Soviet Union were uh, orchestrated directly in the State Department and possibly CIA. This is, first of all, to give too much credit to the State Department and the CIA. Like, I don't think they have any capacity, even if they wanted to, to orchestrate a revolution on the scale of uh, the Ukrainian revolution. Uh, but uh, so, like, I would say uh, his point is uh, hugely over-exaggerated, uh, and uh, he, he's paranoid, of course, that uh, these revolutions may come uh, to Russia, this type of a revolution. Just recently, in fact, uh, he made a statement that he wants to equate colored revolution to terrorism both uh, linguistically and uh, in terms of uh, legal system, which is, of course, uh, I mean, a crazy uh, mm -hmm. thing to do. Thank you. Um, what is the situation in Russia like? The sanctions have been imposed. Has that had an effect, particularly on the economic uh, situation? And what is also uh, Putin's popularity like? Has it been affected by the sanctions? Well, it's a very interesting situation. The economy is clearly affected, and people complain. I mean, there is like shortage, particularly for the for the so-called upper middle class, people who used to eat like oysters or uh, expensive cheese. This is, of course, a very small percentage of population, but. Uh, most importantly, economy will be affected, uh, the banking system, the fact that banks cannot take loans, and uh, banks already, Russian banks, borrowed a lot of money in the West, and they have to pay percentage, and the drastic collapse of the rate of ruble. But psychologically, that's a very intricate situation, because Russian people are not a type of people who want to uh, be told anything, so it's not going to have an effect on Putin's popularity, at least in the short term. And in fact, Putin's popularity has never been as high as now, particularly after the annexation of Crimea. And uh, many people, even who don't like Putin, that also can have a counter effect, because people who don't like Putin, they still may not approve of the sanctions. They think that, why are we punished? Why are you punishing us, not the, not the Russian government? Why are you forcing us? What are you forcing us to do to overthrow our government? Um, thank you. Is Putin running a one-man show in Moscow? Yes. Or are there any possible successors? Are there rivals to him? Is there a power battle going on in uh, Moscow? 
or is Putin really ruling all by himself? He is ruling by himself. This is basically a return to, to monarchy. Like I would say, well, some people, some historians would possibly argue that Russia was always a monarchy, that even like Stalin was a Tsar, Brezhnev, uh, Yeltsin. Uh, Yeltsin, in fact, liked to call himself, he liked uh, his people to call him Tsar Boris. So, like, it, it was always a monarchy. And uh, it's a return to that type of show again. And uh, yes, it's a one man show because it's absolutely unpredictable what's going to happen if he goes. That's the situation in a more a kind of a, um, in, in a society where a political system is more stable. Uh, if a leader, say, unexpectedly dies from a heart attack, no revolution happens or no coup. And in Russia, say, if you, if you imagine that Putin tomorrow dies of a heart attack, we absolutely cannot predict what's going to happen. Like after the death of Stalin, there might be some coup there. Struggle in a very kind of antique Byzantine tradition. Mm -hmm. It always is dangerous to speculate about the future. But if you would like to give it a try, let's say in five years' time, What do you think will have happened in Russia? Will Putin still be there? Will Russia still be in existence? Or what will have been the development? It's true, you know, it's true, sure, but you know, it's true, I agree with you on the first part particularly, that with Russian history, it's extremely difficult to speculate. That's the history of this country, a complete unpredictability. No one could predict the fall of the Soviet Union even like three, four years before it fell. Some people were saying maybe it will happen in 20 years. So it's very difficult to say. Revolution may always come, and you don't need a mass support for the revolution. It could be uh, done through uh, with the support from elites. But my prediction would be, yes, in five years, Putin will be there. There will be more anti-American sentiments and, uh, and anti-Western sentiments. Uh, he will be there probably until uh, most likely 2024, for, for quarter of a century. An economy will deteriorate because uh, there doesn't seem to be a potential for the development of the economy. The life of people, unfortunately, will not become better. Thank you. But in five years' time, you think Russia will still be a great power, or will Russia have disappeared as a United States? Will it have been dissolved like the Soviet Union? Well, it's always possible, and there are people now who talk about the, uh, actually among the Russian opposition, there are several key leaders who said that it's, it's not impossible that Russia will fall apart of the Soviet Union. You have to remember there are really like uh, underground separatist movements in, uh, in Bashkotarstan, Tatarstan. There are, in fact, Russian uh, separatist movements in Siberia. So it's not impossible to, to imagine that, particularly given the fact that the government is clearly very afraid of that. And uh, the proof of that is that just recently Putin passed a law, signed the law, which was approved by the Russian parliament, by the state Duma, that even talking in public about separatism in Russia or publishing on this subject may, may send you for five years uh, to jail. Uh, it's punishable. Uh, yes, I would say one cannot exclude that. And I wouldn't would expect it. I wouldn't expect it. I wouldn't expect it because still uh, the control, particularly with Putin on power, something really drastic needs to happen, really drastic for that to happen, for that scenario to become real. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, going briefly back to the present, um, what actually could be done to improve relations between the United States, between Europe and Russia? The Ukraine crisis, as you know, and Crimea has really uh, brought a lot of tension to the forefront. Has pr uh, relations have plummeted as hardly ever before. So what can be done? In fact, I would say not to tighten the sanctions, because I don't think sanctions uh, is a really smart way to deal with Russia. It's not going to help. And, and uh, the, if the sanctions, it's difficult to imagine that sanction will be totally lifted, but not to make it harder uh, will probably help. Definitely not to make it worse. Okay. And uh, as Kissinger actually said, that sanctions, I think he said, it's not a, uh, it's not a strategy, it's a, lack of stra it's a sign of a lack of strategy. Right. So the strategy needs to be different. For example, you can deal with the Ukrainian government, support the Ukrainian government militarily like West Ukraine at least. But sanctions with Russia, I don't think going to bring uh, great results. Mm -hmm. uh, what is Putin's motivation to support the Eastern Ukrainian separatists and rebels in Eastern Ukraine? Why does he do that? What is he going to gain from it? 
Well, there are several factors here. Like I would say, one is uh, the psychological factor, the nationalist factor, because he doesn't see these people as Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. These people are Russian. And in the language, official language uh, in Russia, this part of Ukraine is not called uh, Ukraine. They call it Novorossiya, which means New Russia. Uh, there is a military factor because he thinks that NATO is, in, uh, is encroaching, basically surrounding Russia, creating a, a, a kind of a, a, a cordon sanitaire uh, around mm -hmm. the Russian borders. So he thinks if he doesn't take Ukraine quickly, that part of Ukraine under his control, NATO troops will be there tomorrow. And of course, he thinks the final goal of NATO is probably at some point when Russia become weak to take Russia apart. So he's afraid that's the motivation. And uh, the, that sounds as if he was still thinking in Cold War terms. Oh, he does talk. He, he does definitely. He's definitely nostalgic. A, a very interesting um, thing that he, in fact, if you look at his biography, he did not live in the Soviet Union at the last days of the Soviet Union. During exactly during 1985 mm -hmm. to 1991, he lived in Dresden, which had a in East Germany. Or, or, right in East Germany, which had a very spontaneous and fast revolution and Soviet Union. For many Russian Soviet intellectuals of his generation, those years were formative years. So he probably does not truly really approve of what was happening and, and what was done. He doesn't publicly blame Gorbachev because Gorbachev is alive and, uh, and uh, that would probably hugely damage his publicity. So he kind of leaves him alone, but he clearly is very unhappy about that. So, so he clearly thinks, in the, yes, in the categories of the Cold War and most importantly, he thinks that Russia is actually still as important as in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And we have to realize that that's an exaggeration. China is way more important today. Some South American uh, countries are. India is a booming economy with a very interesting political system. He still thinks in terms of a bipolar world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Last question. Are you pessimistic or more optimistic about the future regarding Russia and Russian Western relations? Well, like I would say, I am uh, hoping uh, for the best, but preparing for the worst. That's a very diplomatic answer. Uh, like, but it, it's true, I am not personally extremely optimistic about judging uh, from, from the tendencies what what has been happening recently. I'm not optimistic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Peter Elzov, for your Thank insights you so today. Thank, Thank you. you very much.